Hello and welcome to the Bright Talk Lean ITSM and Agile DevOps ITSM channel. My name is David Smith. I'm the president of Micromation. Today's topic is about the rise and fall of the empire, ITIL and digital transformation. And the real question is, digital transformation is altering the food chain. Is your ecosystem adapting fast enough? So sit back and relax. Uh, we're going to cover a, a lot of interesting things in the next little while. I've uh, got some secrets to share with you, so pay attention. I've also hidden some, some interesting prizes throughout the presentation, so see if you can find them as we go through this. So let's get started. Um, first part that I'd like to talk about is I'd like to share five observations that I've seen with digital transformation and specifically how I see it shaking things up. So to start with, I, I want to go back quite some time back to the dot-com boom bust era. This is back in around 2000, 2001. And you'll, you'll all remember this. This is when the, the, the internet and the stocks were going crazy and we, we, we couldn't quite pick which stocks to, to, to run with because uh, you know, it wasn't clear how these companies actually made money. And uh, in some cases, you, you know, you're betting on a hypothetical or hype that was out there. And so, you know, it came and went and a lot of people won a lot of money and made, you know, big fortunes from it. And a lot of people didn't. And, and afterwards, uh, you know, we started to look back and people started to write about what really happened. And there was a number of great books that came out and I've presented some of them here. And they kind of explained some of the uh, intricacies of, of how the internet and the dot-com companies were working and how they made money, how they monetize things. Blue Ocean Strategy was a good one that talked about uh, the concepts of, uh, you know, changing the game and coming up with new twists in, in how to deliver services. Uh, lean analytics, uh, lean startups, uh, value proposition design, business model generation. These ones all came out shortly afterwards and it was kind of like the insider scoop on how these things all worked so this gave us insight to what was really happening and observation number one what they were using is something called lean startups and lean startups is really looking at putting uh, new ideas out to market and testing them quickly to see whether they work or, or whether they fail and uh, kind of failed their way to success. And, and how they capitalized on this is that they were exploiting some of the new technologies that were out there that was referred to as the smack stack or social, mobile, analytic, and cloud offerings. And this gave some competitive advantage and, and some new ways of delivering services. And that was the first wave. And then long and behold, now is, there's a complete generation or a new wave of technologies that are hitting us over the last five years. And things like blockchain and digital twin and AI and Internet of Things and robotics. And these are the, the new areas that people are now mixing these really innovative technologies together and coming up with brand new capabilities and evidence that this is hot and it's, it's, it's really working and it's driving a, a lot of the spend these days. There's a report that's just recently out from Infotech, the CIO trend report. And just FYI, you don't have to copy these things down. I'm going to provide you a reference sheet uh, that you'll get that has all of these links in here that you'll be able to look up this information. But uh, Infotech looked at, you know, what's hot these days, it's, it's robotics, it's AI, digital twin, blockchain. I'm sure you've heard a lot of these, these items. They're always in the news. Uh, they're, they're really changing how uh, work and activity gets done. And you're probably asking, so what does this mean to me and why do I care? Well, what, why you should care is, is that uh, what's happening is, is that a lot of the traditional careers and jobs as we know it are, are going to change or disappear. And there's all kinds of uh, new uh, evidence and, and, and uh, research that's been put in place to look at what are the viable things that AI, as an example, could take over. And food services, manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, there's lists and lists of this stuff and, and what could robotics do. Now, whether this does or does not, uh, you know, tomorrow or the next day, it, it, a lot of it's a question of time and possibility and whether companies get behind this, but there's a lot of evidence that this is going to happen. Let me give you some examples. 
in the news. I don't know if you remember a company called Blockbuster, but um, you know, over 20 years ago, I mean, they were the place to go to get video rentals. And it was kind of a step up and easier to do that than go to the cinemas. And um, a company named Netflix, 1997, decides they're gonna compete in this particular area and they changed the model slightly instead of having bricks and mortar companies, uh, uh, um, investments in those types of assets, they decide that they'll use a rental strategy and they have more attractive pricing and there's no fear of uh, being penalized if you don't bring back your video on time. Well, guess what? Uh, this week, uh, there was a, an announcement in one of the, the newspapers that the last store uh, is finally, um, it's down to one store. They had 9,000 stores. Now this whole thing took uh, 20 years to happen, but it is a good example of how things got disrupted. They changed the model. Uh, it became more attractive to use the uh, one service over the other. And then 2007, uh, the streaming capability came along and even Netflix itself disrupted its own model where it started streaming things instead of mailing things out. And uh, the rest became history that they kind of wiped the you know, blockbuster off the face of the map. Now, this is just one example. There's tons of them out there, and you know all these names, uh, you, you know, everything from Amazon to Spotify, Airbnb, Facebook, Uber, Skype. Um, now, what's interesting here is, is that what they, they, a lot of them are doing is, is they're, they're, they're changing how assets are being managed. Rather than investing in assets, they're, they're using apps to exploit other people's assets and investments, and, and that's a lot of what the strategy is so they don't necessarily have the bricks and mortar uh, facilities or buildings in place or they're outsourcing or using service services uh, as they need them so these are different tactics that they're using to come up with innovative uh, strategies to do this uh, another example of this and although the Netflix example was you know a 20 year kind of story here's one that is uh, in the news it was just uh, in April the Amazon was taking a lot of heat from from the uh, po political scene, and they were, you, you know, being challenged about taking exploiting the postal service. And this is in April, and in a couple of months, Amazon comes up with a new concept where they're offering now to start your own business. It's a franchise for ten thousand dollars. You can become a uh, prime driver and start your own business model. And so, you know, you know, here in two months, they're, they're able to come up with brand new uh, ideas and get them to market. And they're not using their assets, they're using, you know, other people's resources, but it's apps and everything that, that's doing this. And this comes up in the next observation. The pace of change is accelerating exponentially. Like things now with all this capability are going so quickly um, that, that we can't, uh, you can't even fathom how we're going to keep up here. So the, the notion of, of an idea and getting it to market, uh, it, now it's down to months or weeks to test these things out and put them in place and, and see that they're, are, are, are viable. So the, the pace is tremendously picked up. Now that's going to further impact our ability to compete. And, and again, jobs are at risk. I found this interesting uh item here this was on a youtube and, and again these these references are in, in the, the the kit that i'll give to you later but some predictions of ones that we kind of know are sort of on the on the um the way out and new ones some interesting concepts of things like even telecommunications and the phone why do we why do we have phone numbers anymore i mean when you have skype and when you have facebook and all these other Communication means that eventually you, you, you don't need those areas or those, those capabilities anymore. So uh, right down to even like gas stations, I mean, we're going, you know, hybrid cars. So all of the stuff over time is going to change. So in the news, here's uh, another example. This is just another recent article that just came out. And this is sort of in, in my neck of the woods. I'm in Canada. But Manulife, a company, uh, insurance company well-known around here, they are... Uh, cutting a lot of jobs because of, of uh, digital transformation and they're refocusing those jobs into other areas. Another insurance company called Great West Life, they're cutting positions and moving people over into different areas. We've got our big banks, uh, BMO, National Bank, are cutting a number of jobs. Uh, and, you know, where did all the, 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 the bank 
branches go. I don't know about in your neighborhood, but certainly around here, uh, the, the, all the, the, the traditional banks that you, every neighborhood had one, they're, they're gone and it's all gone online. So they're, they're getting rid of those assets and, and they're, they're shifting all of these areas into online and digital transformation. So what does this mean? Uh, they're taking money out of certain areas, jobs are being lost, um, more work is expected to happen with fewer resources. Uh, there's still the expectation you've got to keep up with everyone else. So this is becoming very intense uh, pressure. And this is the next observation, scarcity of resources. So how do you do, you know, the notion of more with less? You got to find ways to, to reduce the waste or do things that, that really don't matter anymore. And so that brings me to the next story. And this one's, you know, more to do with what's happening in, in, in uh, social media. So troll story, there's all kinds of ways now that people can, um, you know, put negative comments out there. And there's this rule of five that normally is five times more likely that somebody's going to say something negative about you than something positive. So you have to make sure that uh, you perform at a, a much higher level and strive for quality so that you don't get flamed or bad reviews you're going to need a lot more positive reviews uh, in order to overcome any of the negativity that could possibly happen. And people also can put fake news out there and they can, they can uh, even make their products look better by, you know, faking sort of reviews and, and, a, and, and, and as well. So it has to be authentic. So these are other areas that there's a, a tremendous need for, for quality systems. So these are kind of like the, the new features that, that you need to be uh, cognizant of that with the, the digital transformation that, that's making this happen. Now, in the news as well, here's another contradiction, however. Uh, Forrester put something out just uh, a, a little while ago, and, the, and they're studying people, and they're, they're looking at different organizations, and they actually asked the question, you know, what have you actually done with digital transformation? and found that uh, a good portion of the companies feel they don't have the right skills. Um, they don't feel confident about uh, the technologies that they have. Uh, and, and some maybe don't get it. They feel that they're done. They already did digital transformation, they've moved on, or some of them are saying that they don't even feel that there's a need to. And so um, others are seeing that, that um, you know, they haven't even invested in, in software as a service. So, so what that to me indicates is, is that uh, on one hand, there's um, companies that get it, they're, they're on top of it, they're leaders, they are, uh, you know, buying up and, and exploiting all of these technologies, and the other companies are going to get blindsided. And I have this vision where you've heard the story about the, the frog and the pot, and then somebody puts the, the flames on the pot, and then water heats up and the frog doesn't know that they're in the pot because they, they just, they, they don't really see the change. And, and so uh, eventually, you know, the frog's in, in trouble. And that, that is kind of what I see from this particular report here that a lot of companies are going to get blindsided. They, they just don't see it coming. So what can you do about this? Well, first thing is um, IT service management has to evolve. It's got to change. It, it needs to speed up and, and be more aware of what's going on. And the good news is that ITIL, and that was the nature of uh, this presentation here, is um, you know stepping up, and they're now looking at uh, improving their practices and becoming more uh, complementary to some of the other. Uh, you know, methods, management methods that are out there like DevOps, Agile, and Lean. And this is music to my ears because um, I've, to give some background, been in, in IT all of my career. I could divide it up into fours. I'd say, you know, one quarter of my time was in ops, one quarter of my time was sales and marketing. Uh, another quarter of my time was in measurements. And the last uh, quarter of my career is it been in continual service improvement? And, and I used obviously ITIL as, uh, as one of the main tools there. But what I found was that it by itself uh, wasn't enough. You, you need more than one tool in your kit bag. 
And so uh, I discovered a number of years ago, Lean, DevOps, and Agile, and um, I kind of put them into my mix, and I, and I found great evidence that if you mix those things together, uh, you have tremendous opportunity to succeed in making improvements and optimizing uh, the way that we deliver our services. And so I've even documented this, and in this Bright Talk channel that I'm speaking to you on, as well as in my uh, YouTube channel, over the last two and a half years, I've been recording all of the engagements that I've been working on in the form of case studies and put evidence in there. So I've got lots of these presentations in here that explain how this stuff works and how it benefits the customers, and, and they're based on real stories. Often, I don't include the name of the customers due to an anonymity, but uh, wanted to make that aware of you, uh, for you, to, to see that this stuff actually works, and this is the right path, and, and ITEL is bang on. This is the path that they have to go down. They have to be quicker to get things to market faster. The business needs it. They, 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 to survive, everything is in light speed now. And we need the ability to work with other uh, known and proven methods to make this successful. So I'm going to share my first prize with you. This is a, a secret formula that I've been using now for a, a number of years. I, I even packaged it under something that I just called it Lean CSI because those were the two main ingredients. But basically it works like this. You, you speak with the customer or the, uh, of the service and you ask them, what is it that's important to you? What do you value? And they will explain to you the kinds of things that they're looking for as outcomes. And then you traditionally go to your toolkit, the ITIL or ITSM toolkit, and you figure out, well, what are the processes that I need to fulfill that capability? And since I'm in CSI, often what I was doing is I was working with companies and finding out either they didn't have these processes or the ones that they did have didn't quite work or they're over-engineered or they missed the mark. So how I started solving things is I used Lean. And so I was using Lean to get to a very simplistic model to find what's the minimum capability that you need to do to provide the maximum value to the customers. And to make it work, I found the most effective way to do it is to use Agile to get things out the door quickly because ITIL typically takes anywhere from three plus months to 18 months, sometimes years for people to put things in place. And that's just not acceptable. You, you need to do things in weeks uh, or, or a very short amount of time. Agile was a way to get things quickly out in place and test and verify that they work. And to, to, to sustain it, what I found was most uh, useful was DevOps, a DevOps kind of model. Because when you dig into DevOps, really it, it's got two components. There's a people component, and that's getting people to work together in teams, cross-functional teams, and uh, as well, there's a heavy notion towards automation that you need to automate everything that you can. So these were the secret ingredients that I had put together uh, in, under the Lean CSI umbrella and found great success with this. And I know that this, this actually works. And that's the secret formula that I had out there. So wh where am I taking you? Well, I, I, I believe that we need to come up with a new business slash IT ecosystem. Um, and what I mean by that is that if I start and explain what I think the digital transformation value proposition is, I would explain it this way. On the right hand side, you have your consumer. Um, the customer is king. And in this case, they provide the demand for uh, the, you know, kinds of services or products that we can provide them and we're the supplier. And so we supply um, this capability to them and the model that we all seem to be using, this is pretty much a, a universal model, slightly different if you're in, in public sector. But if you look at the, uh, the circles here in the very center, there is a value stream. And the value stream is the types of things that we do, the activities that we perform that actually create the outcome that the customer wants, what it is that, that the benefit that they're, they're trying to receive. And then the, uh, the dimensions that interact with that, uh, there's four of them, pull, cost, flow, and revenue. So if we create things that are very attractive to the customer, more customers will 
pull them or, or more demand will be apparent. So there'll be a lot of demand for our services. So that's an attractive feature. Um, if there's a lot of demand, then I, if I'm early to the market and there's not much competition, then maybe I can even charge more revenue. So those are two, two business uh, strategies that I, I might embark on, getting new products out that, that are there, that are attractive, that, that, that I can make money at uh, quickly. Failing that, uh, I need to be cognizant of my cost and make sure that my cost model is in line and as well that my delivery systems flow uh, effortlessly. And so those are kind of like the buttons that I can push that, that uh, are the tactics that I can put in place to actually uh, be successful. And what a lot of companies focus on once you've been out there for a long time is, is and competing with other organizations, you're really in, in the mode of optimization and that's really improving the existing offerings. And so one aspect of digital transformation is improving what you've got, compete more effectively. If you've read the book, uh, Blue Ocean, they, they, they describe this as the red ocean and it's where everybody is doing kind of the same thing. You're, you're struggling to differentiate yourself from others and you use um, all kinds of tactics to cut costs and to flow things more quickly through your organization. Now, if you're innovative, and this is again, the notion from the, uh, the, the blue ocean strategy, you're in the blue ocean, you create offerings using new innovative technologies and, 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 and uh, better management practices to put new exciting products out in the marketplace. And you get an edge on the client and create an opportunity that has limited timing, but uh, a, a way to compete ahead of them and maybe even disrupt everyone else. So you become the leader until everybody figures out what you're doing and then they, they copy you and, and catch up. So this is kind of what, what, what's going on uh, with companies out there, um, you know, competing against one another. So what this means is that we need to evolve and think differently. And this is it's going to take a little bit of thinking because traditionally, uh, IT and business, in my opinion, hasn't had a great relationship. Uh, they are often at odds with one another. Uh, they operate with different languages and um, a lot of secrets and, and, and not much information, information sharing. So. What needs to happen is, is that there needs to be a new model that everybody's working together as a unit and focusing on your customers and, and uh, your, your new competition is like the guy down the street in, instead of internally. So we need to break down the silos and work more effectively internally and figuring out a way that we use a common uh, method of delivering our products and services that we uh, can all capitalize on and work as a team or as a unit. And, and that's where I think and believe organizations will have much more success. Now, what if there was a model that existed that was like this? And um, what if it was very simple in terms of there was only four basic parts, uh, four main activities, and what if didn't matter if you're in IT or whether you're in HR or sales or marketing or manufacturing, really there's four things that, that you did. And if we all kind of understood what those four things were, it would be much easier for us to leverage our existing investments and, and capabilities and simplify what we do so that we could streamline that and be highly effective together. What if there was, in addition to that, a governance and set of principles that helped us focus on really what was most important, that single one thing. And if it helped uh, align us as an organization to be innovative and creative, and as well to keep us thinking outside the box so that we're coming up with new ideas, wouldn't that be great? And the third thing is, what if there was a way to do this in a flexible manner like a management mesh that allowed us like to, as simple as using Lego building blocks, put things together and build things and construct things just as we need them for low cost and move them and morph them and flex them around as required. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? Well, that's where I want to talk to you about a new model that, that came out in the last year. It's called Verison. And this 
kind of blew my mind when I saw it because when I first read about it um, last November, I saw a tweet and I followed it and I went and I, I saw that this was coming and I went, I went, holy smokes, this is this is kind of what the missing ingredient here is because we, we, we kind of have all these great systems, but there's nothing to roll it up and make it work with the business. And so I saw Verisim and got very interested in this. And, and just to give a little bit of background to what Verisim is, it's a service operating model. Uh, its name is an acronym, Stop stands for value driven, it's evolving, responsive, it's integrated in the service management. And the literal translation in, in Latin is it, it, it's really, it's, it's the truth. It's, you know, the warts and all, and, and all of our imperfections, it's, it's how do we deal with the truth of what we need to move forward with. And when you dig into this model, there's some pretty good stuff here, I believe. And it starts with a basic operating model that when you really look at it, we all do the same thing. A service very simply can be put as it starts with the customer and it ends with the customer. A customer needs something, we define what it is that they need, we produce it for them, we give it to them, and if they have an issue with it, we respond and, and, and resolve whatever that issue is. It doesn't matter if you're in sales, doesn't matter if you're in marketing, HR, manufacturing, IT, 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 it's all the same. We all kind of follow that same model, so why, why not use that, that single type of an approach? Now, the model goes on to describe other factors that you need. And one is, and I believe very important, there has to be a governance kind of framework that gives us the vision and the mission of what is that single most important thing that we all need to be focused on. And that helps us organize together with a common theme. And if you take it the next step and put some guiding principles around it in terms of staff service management principles, it, it, it gives us the guardrails from the boundaries from which to work in, but it doesn't constrain us. And if you now give uh, other capability like the management mesh, different ways to get things done, that's the, the Lego building blocks, um, it gives us a lot of flexibility to work um, best, what fits best for what my needs are right now. And so those are, are the basic principles of uh, the elements that are, that are in this model. So, so what's different here? Well, this model, service management historically has been IT centric, hence the name ITSM, that's the acronym we're all familiar with, but where Verisim is different is first of all, its principles are more applicable to the entire organization. It, it doesn't um, constrain us to IT, it's, it's a service provider and, and everybody's a service provider and therefore all departments and all capabilities should be able to uh, take advantage of this. So if I relate this back to the model I showed you earlier, this was what connected for me. It was like taking the model that I had, which I called mean CSI, which I, which I had great uh, success with. And it gave me um, a way to kind of put a governance structure in place or this, this layer on top. So Verisim does not compete with these things, it, uh, it leverages them and it enhances them. And it also gives us a new language, very simplistic language that we can actually uh, talk with our business counterparts and um, find that there's a lot of commonality between what we do and what they do and we all should work from the same page. Now, if I talk about some of the benefits from this, I, I believe that this is a game changer and here's why. First of all, if you've ever read the book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um, one of the number one areas that I find that, that, um, that when I do CSI work is, is that I, I find silos all over the place. People working in their own little area, they, they are very good at what they do, but they've got blinders on and they don't work well with the people next door in the next cubicle or next office. and, and when you read the book, uh, The Five Distinctions or uh, Dysfunctions of a Team, they talk about absence of trust, fear of conflict, uh, lack of commitment, accountability, and inattention to results. So when you put these models together and you get everybody focusing and trying to break down those silos and working as a team and a unit, you get a completely different you know, result. And, and I had experienced this firsthand 
as we started putting these teams cross-functionally in place to solve a lot of the issues. And, and we had great success with it. And they, they end up owning the solution and become very motivated to make sure that it has success. So I saw it firsthand, and, and I truly believe in it. So how does this enable innovation? Well, first of all, the governance structure gives the high-level vision of what's most important, and it's getting down to that one thing that, 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 that we all want to focus on. And in doing so, it, 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 it enables the uh, frontline staff that work with our customers, it, it gives them the ability to listen firsthand because they're the ones closer to the customer. They know what's going on. They know what the customer wants. They know when we mess up and they know what needs to be fixed. So uh, we, we give them the ability to, car to start uh, shaping the strategy and we're just kind of guiding to the one goal that, that we want to do. So it flips the model upside down and it creates all kinds of new and innovative ways to get things done. So there's all kinds of people coming up with ideas on how to improve things. Well, how does that uh, actually translate into reality? If you've read the book, Theory of Constraints, and I'd strongly recommend it, in that book, they, they get to, get, you know, the, you got to find that single item that's the weakest link in the chain. And, and everybody that, that, that's uh, at grassroots level, they kind of know what it is. And if you fix that one thing, um, you're able to, um, you know, improve the entire um, uh, the model. Everything comes up a level. And so this is the, the theory of constraints. And since it's done at, at the working level, the, the people that create the ideas become the uh, fostering um, stewards to make sure that, that it lives. And, and so they are the ones that carry it forward and, and, it, and it's instrumental in, in facilitating change. So it, it, try, it drives the whole thing. So, so that's kind of how the, the, the governance works. Now, what got me really excited when I looked at the management mesh, because this made a lot of sense to me, was is that um, it isn't any one uh, management practice or technology that makes this stuff work. Uh, it, it's the ability to mix and match and experiment and put things together. And I look at it like I always thought that to be successful, you, you need a kind of big toolkit that you can use the right tool at the right time. And, and this is what I saw the, the management mesh as being was this, this toolkit that I could put together for uh, different purposes. And uh, depending on the circumstance, I might use combinations of ITIL, ISO, or, or DevOps, or Lean. And, and, and I found magic potions that, that I had success with in, in doing this. And, and so I think, uh, you know, the Verisum authors that put this together kind of nailed it. This is, the, this is the way that the future has to work, is you, you need the ability to put these strong frameworks together uh, and build on and leverage the investments that you already have. So it's not like you're recreating things from scratch. You're, you're building on what you, what you already have. So this gives us the ability to focus on doing optimization better so that we can, uh, you know, remove the waste from the system and, and, and put our effort towards creating the new products. And that's, that's really what's exciting. That's what's going to get the business people exciting, and, and they need to be a part of this as well. And, and I'm hopeful that you will be excited as I am with this and take this story forward to your uh, business counterparts and start sharing this. And so to, to kind of start wrapping it up, uh, what I'd like to talk about is, is how do you get started here? Well, the first thing in, in any change plan, there's really five basic steps. First part is awareness, like these sessions and, and other sessions that I'll, I'll share with you. Um, you need to, to uh, talk it up and, and talk up the benefits of what this is all about. And then as a part of doing that, you need to look at and see examples of where this has worked so that you can get people excited and build desire that they want to do it. And, and once you have desire, people will thirst for the knowledge and you need to go get certified and really get good at uh, understanding how to put these things together. And then go out and do it. Pick a small project, pick a piece of area. This is how we did it. We were using Kaizen, which were time box uh, uh, methods that we did things very quickly and using Agile and DevOps put them in place. 
got, got uh, good at it and then we reinforced it. So we learned from that through retrospectives and uh, took our lessons learned and then kept applying it again and over and over. So this is a very simple model to get started. Um, if you do this, I believe it, it is in your own best interest because as you saw earlier, digital disruption is going to cause all kinds of uh, jobs as we know it to disappear. Uh, the people, where, where are the new jobs? They're gonna be in areas where you're creating things. So you need to uh, focus on getting your ability, um, your, your value increased for the organization so that you're valuable to, to your organization. It'll help you with employment prospects and as well help you be successful. And, and this is not only an individual, it's a team sport. So getting your, your, your team members involved in this is, is beneficial to them as well. And from a business perspective, I mean, if you can get these models working well in your organization, it's, it's so easy to migrate and, and move it from one group to the next. So they're, they're, it's the impetus for developing better services and understanding what your customers want and being able to leverage these technologies as they come because they're going to keep coming faster and there's going to be more mind-blowing things in the short while to come. So the Verison program, they've done a good job of putting together um, training materials that are out there. Uh, there's a career path at the, uh, the lower level. It starts with a foundation. Then there's like a practitioner level and then leader level. This, this uh, capability is being rolled out. Foundation's already uh, out there. There's lots of people teaching this. Uh, I offer it as well. I'll give you examples of this. In the foundation, you can take um, the seven modules that you get started that you learn about organization, culture, people, the, the new model. And what's very interesting is the progressive practices and innovative technologies because it, it gives you lots of ideas of when to use which particular areas in what circumstance. And so that's uh, great to learn. There's good products uh, that have been produced. So there's lots of literature out there that describe how this all works and uh, putting it together to get started. Uh, I've put together a starter kit, which I'd like to show uh, for you some items that you can consider. Uh, the starter kit, which you'll get through a, a, a link shortly um, in there, we put together a two day foundation certification class. So if, if you're sold on this already and you wanna go get certified, uh, we've got a class that we've set up here uh, coming up in August and that's available and it takes two days and you, you get a certification and then you can go start uh, implementing this. Uh, if you're not quite sold and you wanna be, get more awareness of it, I've also got a, a, a 90 minute version of this, um, which gets into and focuses on not only the approach, but it really talks a lot to do with the progressive practices and the innovative technologies to get the creative ideas going. And we also do a, a readiness self-assessment which uh, will then help you get uh, some ideas in place. Now here's the, the second prize. Um, there's limited seats to this. I can only do 25 uh, people at a time, but this is a virtual class, which I'll be running myself. Um, but there, the, if you attend this class, you'll get a free pocket guide uh, from, from um, Exxon and the Verison team. And then um, what we're gonna cover in there is, uh, all these different practices and, and when is the best uh, circumstance or when do you use these and, and sort of a little assessment um, from that, that you can assess, you know, what you've already got in place and what you can leverage. So that's what we'll, we'll cover in that 90 minute exercise. Now, if um, you're still not convinced and you want to uh, actually see examples of this, uh, I also have another 90 minute session. This is an e-learning which you could attend that is actual case studies, which I put these things together and these are real situations. I have something called the domino effect and value stream. So you'll actually see it in, in the real where we used lean, agile and DevOps to do this. So you kind of get uh, you know examples of how this all works. So those are ways that you can become aware. Um, this is in a link here. Um, that I've put together called the Verisim Starter Kit. And this is the third prize here. I've also put a discount on it. If you act on this, uh, it, there's discounted uh, structures to this. And then finally, 
the list of resources. Uh, this is also in the, uh, the starter kit. So a lot of these um, reports and studies and uh, quotes, et cetera, and the news articles, I didn't make it up, I, it's, it's for real. These are the links to them and you can go uh, read up the stories and, and see what's, um, what's happening in those areas. Okay, so um, I'm gonna take a breath here and uh, I've tried to speed up towards the end here so I could take some questions. I see questions coming in. So I'm going to now read out some of the questions that I've got and uh, okay. Uh, okay, so the first question is, enterprise architecture and frameworks like TOGAF relevant in this model? Yes, absolutely. Um, these architectural frameworks still are relevant. Um, they fit in the management mesh. Uh, as, a, as another uh, tool set that, that is valuable and useful to use. Um, okay, so you're describing a lo lot of what's covered in COBIT-5 without referencing it. Also, these topics have been al amalgamated previously under Agile Service Management. Uh, yes, a lot of uh, what I've seen as well is this, a lot of these um, management practices are coming to the same conclusion and they're amalgamating things together. Um, and uh, that's goodness as well. So the management mesh uh, supports that. And uh, you're gonna see more and more of that. And I know that Agile went, has a lot in the space too, because I, I um, uh, am involved in that area. So they're, they're moving into that space. And yes, COVID-5 also, and, and this is not in competition with any of this, any of these management practices, it's in support of. So that, that's all true. Okay, so what will happen with the current certified ITEL experts after the new version of 18. Okay, they're continuing, as I understand it, uh, Exelos is continuing to support the uh, prior versions of ITIL and those uh, certifications are still going to be relevant. Um, and uh, there will be, as I understand, bridging to the, to the new certification. So it's not like everything else disappears. Um, that uh, is still going to be in place. Okay, so that's it. I don't see any other questions here. So thank you so much for attending. Um, I, I, again, I ask if you would be so kind uh, to rate the session so that, and provide comments or feedback uh, in order for me to improve, that would be great. And I hope that you take me up on the offer to come get more awareness and, and, and hope to speak with you soon in the future. Thanks again, bye now.